NBS Happening Now. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be custodians of this world. We pray that the deliberations for the next two days will make us better custodians and be able to plan for the future of generations. We pray and we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Please take your seats. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Ronnie Mechegwang. I'll be your master of ceremony for the next two days. My background is veterinary medicine, so unless you bark like a dog, I will not be able to assist you if you fall sick. But one of the things as veterinarians we are passionate about is wildlife conservation and ensuring that the environment that our animals grow in actually is sustainably managed. Honorable Minister, before you came, I had a chance to engage with the audience and understand what are the different things that they want to walk away from this two-day carbon markets forum. And it would be unfair of me to start this off without actually doing something very special, Honorable Minister. Each and every single person you see here has come from different places, but I've realized one of the most important things you can do is to collaborate. So how do you, for two days, work together with people whom you don't know? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something special. I'm going to request that where you're seated, more times than not, you're sitting with somebody whom you know, you traveled with, or maybe you've already become gravitated close to. I'd like you to tap the person in front of you and ask them, so, hi, welcome, what's your name, where are you from, and the person behind you. So what this will do is that it's going to create a new network. So within two minutes, please do not tap the Honorable Minister. She's protected. But please, D, please give me some music. I want people to meet people. Find out who they are. Find out why they're here. Ron, that's not fair. You know her already. That's not fair. Please, Ron, get the brief. Create new relationships. One minute to go, one minute to create those relationships. you know that Article 6 speaks to collaboration and the importance that working together will actually help us to be able to achieve a lot more and create more impactful carbon markets. But the question is, what are carbon markets? What are carbon credits? What is carbon capture? Do we really understand the benefits of the carbon markets value chain? So all that and more are going to be points of discussion during the next two days. Honorable Minister, our theme is Unlocking Opportunities for Sustainable Development. And it's my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to please welcome the Honorable Minister to do our opening remarks. Let's give her a big round of applause.
नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल राइट इट्स अ प्लेजर टू बी हियर ऑल आवर डेवलपमेंट पार्टनर्स हु आर हियर आई एम नॉट श्योर वेदर आवर मेंबर्स ऑफ पार्लियामेंट इफ दे आर हियर द होस्ट द वन एमटीएन इन पार्टनरशिप विद द सी ग्रास Vera and others who are also present here the international participants um who are physically here and others are actually online um the representative from various ministries government agencies uh the academia the researchers the private sector and i can see the smiling faces of our youth the young generation dear media fraternity ladies and gentlemen protocol observed it is a pleasure that again i'm here i bring you greetings from my ministry of water and environment and i'm honored really to be one of those selected few to attend um you will excuse if we delayed but i was made to understand that there's a lot of uh interactions before the official opening which i found people gladly doing that and i also tested it here I, it heals it connects it networks so it it has already set pace and now i can make gladly my my statement because you already set you must have known whom you are talking to you must have interacted the mc who has given the overview of why we are here very able mc i also appreciate uh ladies and gentlemen we are here to present a crucial step for uganda towards practical implementation of article 6 of the parish agreement in article 6 of the parish agreement sets out how countries can pursue voluntary cooperation to reach their climate targets and it also enables international cooperation to tackle climate change and unlock the financial support for developing countries in this way it provides a framework for countries to cooperate towards implementation of their national determined contribution through the carbon market and that is found in article 6.2 and article 6.4 and the non market modalities which also is found in article 6.8 uh, on the 13th of november 2021 six years ago after the adoption of the parish agreement by the 196 countries at cop 21 negotiators finally completed uh, the article 6 rule book at cop 26 in glasgow scotland which i'm happy that i led the uganda delegation as delegated by his excellency and um, it was really a privilege to lead that um, delegation and it led to the implementation of article 6 which i have mentioned before to take place to domesticate the decision from cop 26 on article 6 uganda through my ministry established a multidisciplinary climate change mechanism task force to facilitate the in country capacity for the implementation of climate change mechanism and to ensure that uganda benefits from the voluntary cooperation arrangements uh, that Uh, that defines uh, what that is defined in article 6 of the parish agreement the ministry with the support of the UNDP started drafting uh, of the carbon market regulation um, and that is the climate change mechanism regulation uh, to implement section 9 of the national uh, climate change act of 2021 and article 6 of the parish agreement my dear friends 
ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to announce that uh, the drafting of this regulation to guide the participation in, uh, of, uh, in Act of Article 6 and the parish agreement is at its final stage. And very soon, the, ministry, the Minister of uh, Water and Environment will endorse uh, it for gazettement. We are not far from that. And the Ministry is also finalizing the drafting of the Clean Development Mechanism Transition Valuation Criteria to Article 6 of the Parish Agreement. This evaluation shall be conducted by the Ministry and communicated to the UNFCCC, the project that we have succeeded in transition before December 2025. To support the effective implementation of Article 6, my Ministry is enhancing the capacity for greenhouse gas emitting sector working group to manage greenhouse gas inventories and measuring reporting and verification system. With all their government, with all that the government is doing, there are still gaps where we need partnership. And those areas are one, there's an urgent need to increase the, country, the country's financial and technical capacity to effectively implement Article 6. There's also need to accelerate the efforts to integrate Article 6 plans and objectives of the nationally determined contribution and particularly sectoral implementations. There are opportunities to support regional pilot projects and studies. This needs urgent uh, discussion as a region and I'm glad this forum is such a great opportunity for such discussions. As I conclude, I would like to inform you that the government of Uganda, and in particular the Minister of Water and Environment, is committed to supporting individuals, corporate entities, and the community to address climate change actions towards achieving net zero and resilient uh, communities to the impacts of climate change. I therefore urge the general public to be proactive and provide narratives that are radical in challenging the status quo that created um, and uh, recreates the climate crisis for a low emission development pathway and a just society. I've just been in one of the meetings that we are launching the regulation of quality air in this country. These are such efforts we are also including. Um, once more, as uh, was indicated by the MC, people are expectant and uh, I want to welcome you and this forum, uh, the East African Carbon Forum and wish you a very fruitful delibera uh, deliberations, networking, so that as a country, as a continent, as a globe, we get the best of the nature mother is, protect, is giving to us. But meanwhile, let's not forget that before we get the milk, we must protect the animal. So we must conserve our environment in order for us to reap what has brought us to be here through the carbon credit. With this, I gladly and happily on behalf of the government of Uganda to declare this forum open for God and my country. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable Beatrice Anyuara Atim, Minister of State for Environment. Let's give a round of applause as she takes her seat. Next up on the podium, it's my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome the Commissioner Renewable Energy, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, representing Honorable Ruth 
Nankabirua Sentamu, the Minister of Energy. Big round of applause. I present to you Dr. Brian Isabiri. The pleasure this morning to present my have the pleasure this morning to present my honorable minister of energy and mineral development who is not able to join us here today because she's out of the country on other equally important uh, matters the honorable minister would have loved to be here to deliver this keynote address on Uganda's preparedness for climate finance and the urgency to expand clean energy access. The Honorable Minister of State for Environment uh, with us here today, dignitaries and government partners with us here, representatives from the private sector, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to the East African Carbon Market Forum a premier event bringing together key stakeholders in this region's carbon market. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Honorable Minister of State uh, noted, we need to manage climate change. However, we all know and should continue to appreciate that the only chance we have to tame climate change and indeed global warming is to cut global emissions. And to do that, while fostering innovation and growth, we need to put a price on carbon. Carbon price is a market-driven in instrument. And the message is clear. You are polluting, you must pay a price. You want to avoid the payment, then innovate and decarbonize. Carbon pricing pushes the private sector towards innovation. It makes heavy polluters pay a heavy price and the revenue can be reinvested in the fight against climate change, innovation, and a just transition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not only one of the most powerful tools in our hands, it is also one of the most trusted and most tested. But this is not happening. And the reason is that we have a number of barriers that are hampering climate innovation and blocking large-scale flows of private climate finance to capitalize on these investment opportunities, particularly in development countries like Uganda. These barriers exist at all stages of climate innovation, from incubation to early stage growth, and then during the phase of commercialization and technology deployment. And amongst these barriers, we have policy and regulatory risk, as well as technical and above all financial barriers, particularly the lack of access to affordable and long-term project financing. Ladies and gentlemen, clearly there is need for a multi-pronged approach to accelerate and scale up transformative climate innovation in Africa, including establishing uh, a conducive environment for climate action encouraging innovation by facilitating the emergence of new climate solutions and mobilizing finance to scale to deploy new climate solutions and aligning this particular finance for sustainable development to, the, to accelerate and widespread uh, adoption of new climate solutions. This meeting that we are attending today and indeed tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered here to provide our support and resolve to contribute to the global action to create more carbon markets that are aligned with the Paris Agreement and our national development plan and initiatives. As government of Uganda, we want to create and complete our domestic carbon market. As you are all aware, globally there are about 73 carbon pricing instruments which only cover a meager 23 percent of the carbon em global carbon emissions. And this is unacceptable and must increase if we are to allow for a faster reduction of emissions, create a level playing field for international trade, and raise more revenue for global climate action. 
We need ambitious carbon markets. Carbon pricing must remove carbon. With increased awareness about, about carbon pricing, we need to see declining emissions as the economy grows. We need to see increased revenues, which can be channeled to climate action, innovation, and community development. As a country and indeed as a people, we need the private capital to flow into voluntary carbon credits and markets. And to achieve this, the government of Uganda is establishing mechanisms to ensure that investors assure that voluntary carbon initiatives are effective projects. Through the carbon finance, uh, the climate finance unit, government is establishing common standards uh, for projects that reduce emissions. We also need private money to flow into projects that enhance and incentivize conservation of biodiversity. Uganda has enormous forest resources, and as a country, we merit to be rewarded for keeping them alive. Natural resource-based credits or nature credits can play an important role in this pursuit. Ladies and gentlemen, Uganda also recognizes the opportunities for accelerating clean cooking adoption through the carbon financing opportunities under Article 6.2 and 6.4 of the Paris Agreement and is therefore developing regulations on national climate change mechanisms to support implementation of such potential carbon programs. Utilizing carbon driven both, uh, both compliance and vo uh, voluntary markets provide a rig free pressure cooker stoves and fuels at an affordable discounted price could be an effective strategy for climate action. Ladies and gentlemen, there are challenges that stop us as a country to benefit from the carbon credit opportunities. And among these, I'll mention two. The carbon markets ecosystem in Uganda, just like elsewhere in the global south, is hugely fragmented with largely uncoordinated movements of all chain stakeholders. Given the huge market potential, the number of project developers is limited. They are mostly small scale and offer minimal opportunity diversification. You will be uh, surprised to note that 97% of our carbon credits are issued from forest and land use, renewable energy, and household devices. Uganda, unlike her neighbors, Kenya, Egypt, and South Africa, currently has no local validation verification stock verification body. There is no country-based exchange or market uh, places which we will have and continue to work on. There is limited capacity in ensuring standardization, integrity, and transparency. Without clear standards for carbon credits, it can be difficult for companies to know whether they are truly reducing their emissions. There are weak guidance and regulation options which we continue to work on as a country that would then support voluntary carbon markets. As such, there is no perception of integrity in the market as would be expected in a robust and resi resilient carbon ecosystem. The current initiatives under Article 6, a rule book of the Paris Agreement, is hoped as a way to effective international carbon markets to operate and prosper. Increasing market credibility will likely increase the efficiency and efficacy of the markets, their particip participants, and in achieving their climate goals. Ladies and gentlemen, as our mandate of the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development, I would like to mention a few examples of our contribution to the carbon market. The Ministry's priority actions under the updated NDCs are to improve access and utilization of electricity from sustainable sources, promote the use of renewable energy sources and energy efficient technologies, increase access to clean cooking technologies, and rehabilitate and, and make climate proof our infrastructure. The Minister of Energy is leading efforts in responding to the transition to an increasingly multifaceted energy sector with a new forward looking energy policy to guide its operations and to be mainstreamed with the other ministries, departments, and agencies' policies and goals. Our revised energy policy of 2023 recognizes the need to support universal access to reliable and affordable energy services while promoting the low carbon transition in Uganda. The ministry developed an integrated energy transition plan for the country 
which will leverage a market-based approach to harness resources in the short to medium term, but accelerate the transition from fossil fuels, fuels to clean energy. The ministry has received support in updating the standardized baselines for calculating emissions, emission reductions from carbon projects in the energy sector. These include the standardized baselines on charcoal production and consumption in households and SMEs and household and institutional cookstoves. This, we hope, will reduce the cost and time spent in designing carbon projects for the private sector. As I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, these two days workshop should provide us an excellent platform to advance conversations in the carbon finance trajectory. Hopefully, this event can provide a catalytic ignition for cooperation and set a robust benchmark for carbon uh, credit markets in this country. That will require diplomacy to bring more companies and investors on board. We will need frank and open discussions on the kinds of carbon markets that Uganda can pursue. Consistency will be key to make sure that all efforts contribute to the fight against climate change. And finally, I want to thank once again the organizers for this workshop for inviting all of us here to join voice voices to bring all expertise to the table to give carbon pricing and indeed the carbon market in Uganda the push they all deserve for God and my country. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian Isavide, Commissioner Renewable Energy. Give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. We've set the tone for the discussion. And when you're going to discuss, well, you need to be able to hear from the leaders in the market. So in the next segment, we have a panel discussion which we are going to constitute. I'd like to just bring to the attention of the August House that if you're feeling a little bit thirsty, there's water in the corner there and at the back. Feel free to grab yourself some. If you'd need to use the places of convenience, if you walk out on the right or if you walk out on the left, you'll still also be able to access. So, our first panelist on the stage is a lifelong biologist. He's a conservationist at heart. He's somebody who, who believes that collaboration is the best way for us to find a solution to carbon markets. He works with Carbon Tanzania. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO, Mr. Baker, Mark Baker. Big round of applause. Thank you very much. Our next individual is an environmental passionist. He is somebody who has been at the forefront of carbon markets in Kenya. He happens to be the inaugural chair of carbon markets of the Association of Kenya. Please welcome Malon Wallow. Big round of applause. So when you have years of experience in restoration, biomass carbon accounting, and you've raised over $120 million to different projects, and you're skilled in renewable energy, and at the same time, environmental sciences, this is the type of place that you want to be. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of carbon at Sun Culture, Daniel James. And our moderator for the session, she is a distinguished climate lawyer. She is one of the Forbes 30 Under 30 awardees, a key player in the voluntary carbon market. She believes that sustainability is the way to go when it comes to carbon markets. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-founder and chief climate officer at One Million Ton Nation, the one and only Annette Garosa. the wonderful intro <laughs> that was uh, quite amazing and uh, by, uh, before we start I would love to say welcome to Uganda and it's absolutely amazing to see all of you here the dream has truly become alive 
And um, as we are so happy and thankful for all of our partners who managed to get this event here. Thank you so much. And then let's uh, start. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our welcome to our panel discussion, uh, Navigating Carbon Compliance in East Africa. This is specifically a very interesting topic, and as this uh, forum is a knowledge exchange forum, I'm happy to welcome my esteemed guests. And uh, we have 30 minutes of discussion and 10 minutes of que questions and answers, so let's dive in deep into the action. And I would love to start by having a very simple question. Mark, maybe you can start. What is carbon compliance? What does it mean to you? Um, thank you, and thanks for the introduction. That was very rock and roll. Um, so for, for Carbon Tanzania, we've been in this sector for 15 years. That probably makes me a veteran amongst um, many of the people here. And uh, we develop and operationalize red projects. And we work over about 22,000 square kilometers in Tanzania. So compliance for us starts on the ground. Natural resource law, land law, acts around wildlife and acts around forestry. That's where compliance begins because this sector, especially the nature-based sector, is around people, it's around ownership, and it's around transparency. That's what creates the high integrity. Um, when we move up from there, we have finance laws. We transfer a lot of finance to communities, so taxation, laws around the movement of money, how that money is transferred. Compliance is really important in terms of the making the finance visible within the government's own, own system, including taxation, of course. And then we can take a step up to the carbon regulations that are now in place um, in Tanzania, which, which are key, again, and uh, we've been involved in developing the carbon trade regulations in Tanzania. And that's about protecting the community members. It's about ensuring that finance is going where it needs to go. Thank you so much, Mark. So next to the Malon, what is your carbon compliance definition? Thank you, Annette, and thank you for having us. Uh, Uganda is actually quite beautiful. Um, I think uh, compliance is mostly about um, legislation, and I'd say having the whole um, carbon and um, climate change um, address regulated, and mostly not just regulated by words, not only by action, but enshrined into law, and have everything on um, binding legislation. We need some of this information um, locked in the Constitution, so we have a lot of compliance. Um, so this is about talking about um, capping emission from manufacturers. This means incentivizing those who are reducing emissions, and basically a reward and punishment system of those who do right and those who do wrong, respectively. Great, thank yeah. you, that is a wonderful answer. Daniel, next to you. <laughs> yes, um, indeed, um, I want to thank everybody who has been part of organizing this forum. It's, um, it's amazing conversation. Uh, thank you to Juan and Tian, it's a lot of effort. Um, just to talk a little bit about what carbon compliance means to me, um, uh, we're looking at compliance specifically as adherence to um, um, you know, the core carbon principles um, and being able to confidently demonstrate that your core carbon principles are in line with national um, regulatory framework and international be best practices. So this is, um, if I try to unpack a little bit what the core carbon principles might look like, all of us are probably aware about this in the room, um, that um, a mitigation activity is uh, compliant to social safeguards and that we're able to confidently you know, demonstrate our governance framework, um, adding on to what Max said via transparency and bringing on an integrity aspect to it. Um, uh, most importantly is that we can report you know, confidently and verify our emissions reductions. That, that to me is an umbrella of compliance because it brings the markets from um, a zone of you know, um, volatility to a point where we can actually start to um, identify carbon 
um, as, a, as, a, as, a more, as a more strategic um, asset class. Great. And uh, this year in the forum, we have a great motto. It's uh, unlocking opportunities. And I see today here a lot of smiling, positive faces. Also the networking before event start, we, s we heard a lot of chatting and uh, upcoming project discussions. So I would love to actually to ask you a question. Mark, where do you see opportunities in the region? Well, I think everybody in this room understands that they're, they're endless. Uh, and I think it is really important to um, configure, to define the conversation around climate change mitigation as one of opportunity. I think that's really important. Um, I am an optimist by heart, but, but really in this part of the world, again, for me, especially in the nature-based space, there is huge opportunity. We are at the beginning of this journey. I think in 20 years' time, we'll look back and those that are not involved and who should be um, will feel like they've missed out. I, I think we're going to see a, an enormous transition into large-scale financing of landscapes, into the transition of energy, and that's what we need it to be, um, to, to be able to um, meet the targets. And let's be honest, we are way off target. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's endless opportunity certainly for us we are in a rapid growth phase and uh, as I always say to people I will carry on going until somebody stops me so um, sure. yeah uh, so far so good I think there's lots of opportunities yeah I love how you put that uh, we have a target but actually also it's on a, in a context that we also have a day-to-day -day challenges and these kind of opportunities can also unlock a better you know sustainable development goals so thank you Malon over to you Definitely, yes. I'd say we have uh, countless opportunities. I quite agree with Mark. And uh, being that the global south is, um, I'd say, a heaven of opportunities even more because there's so much more to do um, because of the available nat natural resources. I mean, um, just if you fly over Uganda and just look down, then you see the vast forest cover. Um, and that's massive in terms of opportunity. I believe to be able to tap onto this or how to tap onto this should actually be the question and not whether or not we have opportunities. So because the answer is definitely yes. The question that we should actually be answering is how do we actually unlock these opportunities and without limiting them to the few elites who are um, aware of them. Um, so how do we get everybody um, interested, everybody talking about this, everybody acting on it um, to I mean, sort this out together. Um, so the opportunities are endless. I'm also strong with Mark on the nature-based solutions because I think those come naturally to all of us um, and they're readily available, uh, very minimal technology involved, but a lot of passion and love for environment um, helping us to unlock these opportunities, yeah. So a lot to be done, plenty of enough for everyone. Um, there's no limitation. There's no rigidity, there's no closed doors, there's no red tape. So everyone can do something on this. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quick, quick follow-up question. Go, go ahead. What do you think, are we unlocking opportunities fast enough? No, we are not. Definitely, <laughs> definitely not, yes. Um, I, and I think it's, it's more of an educational problem, um, but I think it's being addressed also. Uh, forums such as, as this one, um, trying to bring um, the East African region together helps us now to put our heads together and sort out our eggs. Because uh, now we, we know what the problems are, we know what the solutions are, uh, why are we not acting? So it is now up to the people in this room to tickle our governments and have them actually putting their actions and their mo money where their mouth is and all those um, uh, offsetters and all those kind of people moving around, so putting our house in order, which helps us to execute this, right. actually, yeah. Absolutely love the answer, because we also, as our organizers and together with our, our, uh, our partners, we see that this kind of forum actually can bring uh, action-oriented uh, steps, because sometimes the stakeholders in one project are from different parts of the world, and uh, maybe we can bring a trust in the market much faster and unlock the opportunities much faster. 
Daniel, you probably know the question about opportunities. Are we optimists? Yeah, um, it's a good segue to where Melon has left it out, that the opportunities are endless. Um, um, one way I would have looked at it is drilling down a little bit into um, the fact that there are a lot of opportunities for um, tech-oriented um, development process um, towards getting ready for uh, compliance markets. Uh, beyond that, I think also just looking into um, how the financial assistance that um, ministers mentioned is required for Uganda, for instance, uh, could be well allocated. So um, I, would, I would have seen a lot more of, you know, um, using tech and data to inform exactly how we can position these opportunities. They're endless. And for the next part, I see a very interesting consolidation uh, for the first time, so many different government ministries coming together, you know, to kind of make decisions and, and think about the interest of how do we utilize carbon finance, you know, uh, in the short term and the long term. So all these are um, really exciting um, opportunities for innovation. Sure, sure. And I think uh, as the discussion already kicked off on a very positive manner, but we need to a little bit dive deep into some case studies and uh, some, some targeted topics. And I think that, Mark, you are the, uh, the perfect pers person to answer maybe your takeaways as Tanzania has uh, climate regulations in, in place. Uh, how does that affect the business as a project developer? Well, I, I, I think um, you will often hear people in this space talk about what the government can do, what the government should do. Um, I don't want to be too JFK about it, but the reality is I think governments also need show and tell. I think they need entrepreneurs. I think you need examples in countries that governments can look at. I think governments talk well with other government departments, and when these projects are real, when finance is being realized, then that helps the expansion and understanding of what this, what this is. Um, obviously, we validated our first project in 2011, so we were quite ahead of the curve, um, but we took it on ourselves to work very closely with government in the finance, learning with the tax system, um, creating forums in which we could help educate in terms of what this new asset class is and can be. And we've worked with the government in Tanzania for just over three years in the development of the carbon trading regulations, which, okay, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good. Uh, they, do, they do important things. They, they state um, international regulatory process. They state international standards. They protect the communities. And, and I, I, I can't overstate that, that this is really important that we ensure that the vast majority of this finance is going to where it needs to go. We do not want this to turn into an agricultural commodities market. That's, that's not what we want. And you know that process has been a long journey. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I think uh, my colleague Brahima is here and she'll talk about Article 6 in Tanzania later on today, so I'm not gonna delve into that. Um, but it's also about aligning tax law, natural resource law, land law, and these are not easy things to do because they sit in separate ministries, and I'm sure my colleagues from the Ugandan government here today fully understands that ministries are generally siloed, <laughs> and so it is quite hard to create communication across ministries. So it, it takes time, it takes trust, it takes energy. Um, I had a lot more hair when I started, um, <laughs> you know, so, and I think that both the finance, the money needs to understand that, I think people need to understand it in country, that if you are looking to finance carbon projects, you can't be sitting there saying, well, we're not gonna move money until this happens, because then it's not gonna happen in any meaningful way. We need to, we need to move. Um, the entrepreneurs out there, and I know you're there, need to move um, and feel energized, and then take your government along on this journey of understanding. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, will be more about uh, market mechanisms. Uh, Malon, as a chairman of um, Kenya Carbon Markets Association, uh, I would love to understand how do you see how the uh, mechanisms as carbon trading has uh, 
affected or prom are, is promoting a carbon compliance? It's a really good question, actually. Um, so carbon compliance is uh, quite crucial um, in two aspects. So we need, we need a bit of some sort of regulation because if you're complying, you have to comply to something. So um, we need a bit of compliance from the emitters. We need a little bit of compliance by um, uh, offsetters and offtakers as well. So project developers so as well, some sort of compliance on that. But let's talk about how do we now use the market as a motivator for compliance. We have all these immense opportunities where a lot of um, industries can be formed, can be created. So we need l to incentivize these people so by doing things such as um, green labeling for people who actually are taking care of the environment more than others. We need to have a reward system. We need to talk about tax incentives for um, people who actually take care of the environment. Um, we need to look more um, into even punishment, I'd say, um, of those who uh, disregard some of these regulations as well. But the market is definitely growing, and um, we need to have a little bit of a balance on a, and a reward system uh, because uh, there's an immense opportunity and the compliance and uh, the voluntary market is really growing and the education is out there. It's just a matter of, as I said in my first statement, is we need to put this into legislation and then that will boost the sort of natural flow of the market because the market forces always happen to be stronger than um, any other forces when it comes to financial markets. Yeah. Great. Uh, I see a lot great can happen and in every opportunity is always development costs and we need to give out initiatives for the private sector money who would love to create those kind of opportunities. We need to understand of course what is the impact and, uh, and that could be also rewarded. But uh, speaking about technology, Daniel, I know that you're a technology person. <laughs> Can you maybe guide us where the technology is coming in into the carbon compliance? I mean, t yes, I'm a bit of a, I'd say I'm a bit of a technology person. Um, and this, there is methods of technology that help with this. And I'd say um, one of the projects that we do ourselves is a little bit of a technology-based project. And this is on biochar. And, uh, it's a carbon capture method and uh, it's a high technology one, what we do, really, um, high tech pyrolysis. Um, so those are some of the technology aspects that we can employ into kind of this. And again, it takes a lot of high tech engineering, um, a lot of education that goes on. So I know um, uh, Daniel talks, works on sun culture. There's a lot of, a lot of technology that goes around that. Um, so technology can be employed widely um, in solving some of these problems, and uh, it's not, it's, I think it's really at the core center of this, because when you talk about even a lot of nature-based solutions, the MRV processes really rely on a lot of technology. We're talking about a lot of data analysis, um, remote sensing, all this GIS and land mapping, all that is a lot of reliance on technology that um, makes it really efficient to be able to measure the efforts that we're making. Thank you. Daniel, you have worked with development agencies on Earth ob observation and AI. Maybe you can share a little bit lay, uh, light on how do you think we could leverage technology? Thank you, Annette. Um, just to build on to what Marlon has said, I, I see um, technology being an enabler to this all um, carbon compliance framework, uh, specifically um, looking at how we um, are approaching markets, um, um, we need to integrate a lot more valuation methods of knowing exactly what's our asset base. Um, it has been simplified uh, very much with cutting edge technologies, um, and, and this helps to really drill down into specific natural resources and perhaps really know exactly if I'm going to negotiation table, for instance, with a receiving country. Um, as a host country like Uganda, do I know the value of uh, you know the resource base that I, I own? So I think this is really becoming um, a critical conversation. I've seen as well um, um, 
technology really being able to demonstrate that we're compliant. You know, um, if you remember my initial um, de definition of compliance is really towards being able to confidently demonstrate that you are compliant with the core carbon principle. That additional um, is your mitigation activity permanent. Um, I think tech is taking a very good center stage in demonstrating most of this. Um, so satellite data augmented with machine learning models have advanced to places where we can see um, um, the precision accuracies that are being reported uh, to help us really to account on our resource base looking into you know natural resources and specifically carbon is becoming you know more um, more centralized and, and common so I think um, this is this is kind of rounding up the way we have seen tech really getting into the uh, space of the um, uh, carbon compliance yeah, thank you so much I think we have a final uh, question and this question goes to mark because we are, have been talking about opportunities we have been talking about the community impact how do you see a community involvement into the carbon projects? How does that help for the carbon uh, compliance? Does it help? Is it impactful? Um, essential. essential. Uh, the, the <laughs> climate change, mitigation, and adaptation is a people problem, um, and uh, and people will 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 solve it. I mean, certainly in the nature-based space, and I think I would say essentially across. Tanzania, um, even in energy, um, the individual and people and opportunity and jobs, all of these things are, are critical. What we're looking at is essentially landscapes where people have very few choices in terms of how to monetize the environment. You either farm it and often you're stuck then in a poverty circle of um, poor quality farming on poor soils, you cut it down and convert it to an energy source, or you leave it alone and, alone and somebody else does that. This creates an opportunity to monetize, and significant amounts of money. Um, and, and that allows people to diversify. And, and so if we look at our YIDA project, where we've done a lot of social impact monitoring and understanding, what people talk about when they talk about the result is that they talk about land security. They talk about the fact that education is completely taken care of. Hundreds of young um, boys and girls at university. They talk about healthcare and provision of that. But they also talk about governance and what, what, how this finance has strengthened their own governments, their own governance structures and recognition amongst the district. So I think the, the outcomes of community engagement in the nature-based space through carbon finance, through climate finance, is massive. The impact is transformative um, because it, it, is, it is always been the missing piece in conservation. That's why I got into this. You know, beekeeping projects are never going to cut it. Um, we need to significantly value nature, and I think climate finance provides the opportunity, the first opportunity we've had to really value nature. Thank you so much. I think you put it absolutely perfectly. And uh, my, my best takeaway would be that hopefully uh, we can also account for this impact because we need to understand each project, what is the, what is the value, what we are bringing into the market. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had a wonderful discussion. I would love to open up the floor for some questions, if there are, are some. Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, congratulations for the, organiza the organization. Um, my name is Pepe Grego. I represent RIP. Uh, RIP is an NGO uh, with over 20 years experience in developing renewable energy projects uh, in Africa. We have provided grants to hundreds of companies, including Sun Culture. Uh, the first grant to Sun Culture was actually in 2016, and the last one was just a couple of months ago. Uh, with uh, the BGFA uh, program. So uh, we understand very well um, the technology, uh, the impact to the community, but I think there is a missing uh, point that I would like to understand more from Daniel and from Mark, which are the buyers of the credits. Uh, we would like to understand a little bit better uh, what is your relationship with the buyers of the credits, 
um, do you sell the credits uh, fully on the on the market on the marketplace or you already have buyers even before uh, starting the project uh, development and implementation uh, how does this relationship play and I think this is will be very interesting with the for the hundreds of companies that are out there already generating uh, impact um, but they, they are still lacking that capability of accessing the market. Thank you very much. So who's first, Daniel or Mark? <laughs> I'll go first. Daniel. All right, um, so I think what you've uh, touched on is a very important topic, um, looking not only from the compliance market side, but also in the VCM, uh, which is how do we go to market? Um, it, it's very fragmented and I think comes from different project designs. Um, the way we refine a go-to-market strategy from most of the projects we develop um, at Sun Culture and even um, other uh, programs we participate on regionally is really um, how do we demonstrate quality to the buyers. Um, so again, for us, it's bundled around um, a decent design framework that takes on international best practices in carbon. Uh, then the price, you know, kind of, you have people coming out for you. So um, it could be through, you know, showcasing the projects on uh, carbon broker platforms. Um, sometimes it's specifically through um, future carbon purchase deals. Um, I think you must have been aware about um, the deal structures that um, Sun Culture is looking at. And right now what we're doing is organizing a corporate environment where we can allow the various investors to select based off of geographies how they want to allow. Um, uh, the market is transitioning so much that we, you don't need to go again selling your credits. I think you need to demonstrate your clear carbon strategy and then you will have a lot of forward finance coming in and locking in you know, the um, mitigation outcomes that are generated out of the project. So it's, it's a very different guard to market strategy um, compared to what used to be conventional in the VCM system. So, yeah, I think that's one of the um, important go-to-market strategies that I've seen is becoming more bankable um, with, you know, future finance and the most of these problems. Uh, yes, all of that. Um, there is a timeline in which I answer that question. Uh, Twelve years ago, um, develop under the, on the sweat of our brow and um, sell directly. Uh, that is not the case now and has not been the case for the last six years. So we do sell some directly, um, but for the most part we have very long-term offtake agreements, um, some of which are linked to pre-financing, um, some of which are linked to pre-financing and then share of um, credit. So, so actually it's a hugely diverse answer but 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 one of the points that Daniel touched on you have to be good at communications you have to communicate what you're doing you have to pull together data on social impact that's really important because the buyer of course is that buying the metric of the carbon what they're doing is really buying the output of the entire process so marketing and communication strategy drive um, sales and I think that's Critical, and I think in, in the red space, especially over the last few years, with um, some of the very poor media coverage that's um, looked at how carbon markets work, often driven ideological or a lack of understanding or appreciation for the scientific process. But also, you know, there are elements of truth to that, and the elements of truth are poor communication from the project proponents in terms of what this market is. Um, so. I think the answer to your question is extremely complicated and extremely diverse, and it's changed over time. Um, what we have learned over the last decade is sales and marketing strategy, lead sales strategy, um, development of high integrity projects, do everything at least to the standard and above for us, focus on biodiversity, we do landscape connectivity, um, so we're focused on connecting big landscapes uh, for conservation. So think carefully about where you put your projects. And all of that is feeding sales. And you will get markets that are interested in those specific type of credits. 
Thank you so much, Dana and Mark. Uh, do we have the, yes, I wanted to open up the floor for the feedback. All right, do we have any more questions? Yes, we have the feedback from the Honorable. Oh yes, Honorable, let me have you my microphone. Um, once more, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank the um, panelists who are there and what they are presenting. Uh, I, I had the presentation. I thought w we needed to give a few highlights. I want to thank you for what you are doing in your various capacities. Um, I just wanted to draw the attention of the House that uh, the, the UNFCCC uh, has given guidelines on how you can participate in carbon market. As a country, um, we have done our best, and one of these is that, I can just, uh, if you give me the, if you are not time bad, to run for the best purpose of information for the house, that we country must be part of the UNFCCC, which we are as a country. Uh, we have communicated our NDC. We have also provided um, our recent um, greenhouse inventory, though not fully. Um, we have met a number of the requirements as guided by the UNFCCC. However, there are some which we have not completed. We have uh, uh, policies, regulations, as you are aware. We have a Climate Change Act. We, are, we have just told you that the regulation on the carbon uh, market is in the offering. So we are still doing that. But we also still, as a country, uh, we have not um, finished uh, with the strategies for monitoring uh, environment, environmental and social safeguards, which we must put in place. Um, we have also not fully functional greenhouse gas inventory. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. And these tools are not yet, we are not yet there. We, have, we must also have a fully functional national uh, monitoring reporting verification this one we is, is midway. We have already uh, started on that. It's not fully oper uh, operational. We need a, a CDM uh, transition mechanism procedures also to be in place. And we need a fully functional carbon registry to track the carbon credit transition. So these are requirements by the unf 2 c where we belong. And uh, I heard uh, from uh, one of the speaker, uh, Mark Becker from Tanzania, said we are silent about that. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, I, I don't think we are silent. Action is speaking louder than the words. But as a country, Uganda, we have not fulfilled the guidelines of the N, uh, UNFCCC. Secondly, well, as I told you, well, our, our guidelines regulation for the carbon market is not yet done. Now, to fellow countrymen and our partners who are who want to partner with this country. I think it would be important that as a country, we, we set ourselves ready with the regulation that will set us to know what to do we negotiate with incoming partners. And I'm sure the partners would want to know on what legal regime you want to operate with the country. Now, it's like oil and gas when we had the discovery. So many partners were interested to come and work with us. But we had, first of all, to put the regulation, the laws, in place, and it guided how we negotiate. Uh, this is also one of the upcoming source of, of funds, of financial uh, capacity of this country. But you find that, I, know, I really appreciate the enthusiasm which uh, our development partners have. But as a country, we don't want to be taken advantage of it including the, the, the Ugandans themselves, because this resource must benefit our communities. The carbon credit originates from our farmers, our Ugandans, who at the end tail must benefit at, uh, out of it for any transaction 
at any partnership we undertake as a government with the, our development partners. But, and as you heard from my, my, my colleague from the Minister of Energy, you know, this is now like a trading uh, or commodity which has different prices. Now, we need also to set that one clear and we know what is Uganda going to get, how does it translate to our ordinary uh, farmers, communities down the road? What about our other sectors? We are, inter we are already implementing all this intervention, but we are taking caution to have our regulation in place to guide our understanding of the pricing, the marketing, and then the, 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 the geopolitics around carbon uh, markets. So I pray that you take this and uh, not as silence, but we are only conscious that we don't get a raw deal for our people. And Ugandan out there, my appeal is that you are seeing this coming. Please plant more of our trees because this is going to be a source of carbon uh, and other interventions as guided by the government. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Honorable. Thank you, Honorable. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is the tone that we wanted to set for our first panel discussion. Let's give them an amazing round of applause. Thank you very much, Annette, Thank you. Daniel, Malan. Thank, Thank you, Mark. So I think um, it's time now for you to So if you've just walked in, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the East African Carbon Market Forum. Our next speaker is somebody who has worked with governments in both public and private situations. She works for a global carbon credit ratings agency. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the policy manager at B Zero Carbon, Lily ginsburg Keg. Big round of applause to her. Um, I did have a presentation today, but unfortunately the computer's currently frozen, so I will excuse me if some things are not mentioned in the speech. Um, but I first want to say thank you so much to the East Africa Carbon Markets Forum and to Annette Garosa for inviting me to speak today. I'm very excited to be here. I'm Lily ginsburg Keeg, the Policy Manager at B0 Carbon, the Global Carbon Credits Ratings Agency. B0 equips organizations with the knowledge and tools they need to better understand carbon quality at any stage of the project life cycle in any sector. We work to ensure increased transparency and integrity in carbon markets. Firstly, a bit about me. I have a background in climate and environmental policy. Previously, I worked for the UK government advising on environmental policy before moving into... Before moving into the private sector to work as a consultant where I worked with local and national governments to develop plans to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Working at B0 Carbon, I focus on government advocacy and engagement and analyzing regulatory developments across voluntary compliance and Article 6 carbon markets. Today, I'm going to be speaking about, oh, today I'm going to be speaking about how to build a credible and transparent carbon market. Um, and sorry if any of the text doesn't make sense. I think in sending it through, it for some reason changed it slightly. 
So firstly, why focus on carbon projects? Simply put, investing in climate projects is essential to delivering a sustainable future. Carbon markets are a key mechanism to deliver climate finance on a global scale. Carbon markets enable businesses and governments to actively invest in climate projects, bringing about substantial local and global benefits. The more, effect, the more effective the carbon market is, the greater and more sustainable benefits are. Effective carbon projects can contribute to keeping global temperature rises to within 1.5 degrees Celsius and improve social, economic and environmental outcomes. From improving health through cookstove projects to job creation in emerging sectors like engineered carbon removal, environmental enhancement via reforestation. The trajectory of carbon markets has been one of growth over the past two decades, even with the numerous controversies and concerns over quality that have occurred. The VCM has grown out of earlier carbon crediting mechanisms, particularly the Kyoto Protocol's clean development me mechanism, and the Paris Agreement in 2015 further galvanized countries and corporations to act. Since the early 2000s, issuance has grown to 300 million tonnes and retirements of 600 million tonnes annually. Market analysts are now optimistic, predicting substantial growth in the voluntary carbon market, driven by factors like enhanced buyer confidence, compliance schemes like Corsia, Article 6 negotiations, and the integration of compliance and voluntary markets. However, to realize this growth, it's imperative that the market addresses existing challenges, such as concerns over quality, establishing strong price mechanisms, and ensuring transparent and robust MRV systems. The future growth of carbon markets hinges on building a market that is characterized by credibility and transparency. So what are the key ingredients to creating a scalable carbon market? To scale the carbon market effectively, we need to focus on creating a credible and transparent market. Sorry. This involves information and data disclosure. So for example, mandating publicly available information to allow for increased transparency clear rules and processes, providing clarity on rules and processes for the functioning of carbon markets, including aspects like project development, authorization and verification, and where revocation is allowed. Supportive regulatory environments, we need policies to accelerate the market, protect communities, project developers and investors, and ensure indigenous community rights and the environment are considered. We also need to create a stable market environment that is attractive to both public and private investments. A strong price mechanism is needed. Project developers must be incentivized to produce high quality projects. Innovations such as carbon credit rating can help ensure the quality of the carbon credit is reflected in the price. International alignment across all these policy initiatives is also key. Ensuring interoperability internationally is essential to creating a global carbon market. So what has the market already been doing? The market has already been doing several different innovations. For example, we are witnessing proactive steps towards rebuilding trust, such as shifts in corporate strategies to avoid greenwashing claims by following pathways set out by the VCMI, the Oxford Offsetting Principles, and other guidance. Great alignment across the demand side guidance, as seen at COP28, with an end-to-end -end integrity framework announced by the ICVCM, VCMI, and SBTI. Initially, there was concern about how all of these initiatives would fit together. So it's great to see a positive step forward. Lastly, we're also seeing private sector innovations like insurance and ratings for carbon credit projects. These steps have been integral to building credibility across the carbon market. However, another key aspect is policy and regulation. Governments are increasingly involved in carbon markets, creating new standards, developing and investing in projects. This policy background is dynamic and evolving rapidly. We've seen the introduction of demand and supply side regulation the utilization of carbon credits in compliance markets, and the operationalization of Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement. The incorporation of carbon credits into compliance schemes, for example, Singapore's carbon tax, allowing 5% of the obligation to be met with high integrity international carbon credits, is a great step in the right direction. The market has been getting more attention from the traditional regulatory bodies, more commonly seen in financial markets. In the US, the CFTC held consultations around climate risk including around carbon markets. The SEC proposed rules around carbon purchase disclosure, and the EU have provided more clarity on green and carbon neutral claims, 
However, this is still being determined and explored. Supply side countries are introducing carbon market frameworks and providing clarity on aspects such as taxes and benefit sharing. For most market participants, regulation is a really positive thing because again, this sets the guidelines for what you can and can't do. We are also seeing progress on Article 6 with over 80 bilateral agreements announced under Article 6.2 and the first correspondingly adjusted credits appearing in the market. A supportive policy environment is key to build confidence in the market and enhance credibility and transparency. Policy acts as the basis for which we can build a robust and scalable market. So what's happening in East Africa? East Africa is a key player in the evolving market. Carbon markets serve as a key source of climate finance in East Africa. We are seeing countries begin to develop bespoke policies and initiatives to galvanize the market. And we're also seeing increased rates of issuances across Africa. So in East Africa, Kenya is number one in the amount of credit issuances and Uganda is number two. East Africa has already been developing supportive policy and regulatory plans to support the establishment and acceleration of carbon markets. Uganda in particular is actively developing its carbon market through robust policy initiatives and regulatory frameworks. The Ugandan government has made significant strides by incorporating carbon market strategies into its national climate change policy and it's reassuring to hear that their carbon markets regulation should also be coming out soon. We've seen how Uganda's climate finance unit intends to develop national policy and regulations to further build up Uganda's carbon market capacity. By East African countries implementing carbon market regulations, key players in the market will know the processes and steps that need, they need to take to become involved. However, alignment is key across the market and we need to make sure to mitigate against fragmented policies. But apart from this policy and the integrity initiatives that are taking place, what else is needed? Private sector innovation, one of which is carbon credit ratings. Carbon credit ratings allow you to understand which project is actually having the biggest impact. While policy is essential to set up the structure and processes for the market, it does not assess how effective a project is. This is where project level assessments and carbon credit ratings play a role. Ratings can help people understand project differences between and within a sector. Credit quality, as we've seen, is coming under increased quality, scrutiny. Market stakeholders are becoming more concerned about quality, especially when low quality projects can result in reputation risk. Industry initiatives like the ICVCM's core carbon principle are seen as essential to restoring confidence, but only assess quality at the methodology level. Ratings as an innovation addresses project level assessments that policy cannot. Carbon credit ratings provide independent risk-based project level assessments, which increase buyer and investor confidence. The B0 carbon rating reflects our current assessment of the likelihood of a carbon credit project achieving a ton of CO2E absorbed and or removed for a given period of time. So when you think about factor in the widely different ways you can design and implement a project within a given methodology, there is clearly a huge variety of, of outcomes. What we have seen when we assess the carbon efficacy within a sector is this can greatly change. For nature-based solutions, it's no, it can go from a double A rated project to a D rated project and so on. With this variance, it's no wonder that there is, has been criticism and it challenges the idea that you can loop every credit together like a commodity. We've recently completed research that demonstrates how better rated projects command a rising premium. Since launching in April 2022, the price premium for highest B0 rated credits over other lower rated credits has grown over 50% to 200%. On average, there is a 25% price, a price difference between credits separated by one B0 rating notch. It is clear that the market is rewarding developers who are achieving the highest outcomes. So far, we have rated 14 projects in Uganda, and those projects go from a B rating to a double A, demonstrating the potential of projects in the region. We analyze these projects by working with a large range of different data sources, including Earth observation data, and working with space agencies and other key partners. We also use spatial data on land ownership, population density, road networks, and climate, and so on. We create machine learning models that give a more accurate reading of the project's likely carbon accounting. That is, how much CO2 would have been avoided or removed if the project hadn't taken place compared to what the project claims. This is combined with forensic policy and financial analysis, such as land, pe such as land tenure disputes or economic viability assessments, bringing a holistic view of the project's effectiveness. By actually being able to assess projects on this scale, 
means that we add additional transparency to the market and actually show how a project is performing. We've also been expanding, exploring new innovative ways to measure bi biodiversity. We're currently trialing an eDNA project in Uganda's Kabali National Park to actually see how we could look to measure biodiversity and what are the improved ways we can do it. So lastly that I'm gonna talk about is the innovations we see developing in the market. In the last few years, we've seen a number of innovations and developments that are changing carbon markets dramatically. The data, information and tools available to market participants are significantly different compared to a decade ago. There remains a lot of work to be done to grow these markets to make a meaningful, to make a meaningful net zero contribution but these innovations are laying the foundations to get us there. So what do we see as the key innovations in the future? We see ratings as a sign that carbon markets are adopting the language of risk. Regulators and initiatives being implemented. Satellite imagery being used to actually show how a project is performing. Technological removal, engineered carbon removal projects actually setting off and starting to scale. MRV becoming improved and utilizing technology and other aspects to become better. Insurance, enabling people to put the risk where people want to put it. Funding, we saw six to seven billion last year in carbon markets, and this is predicted to increase greatly. We're also seeing the introduction of unique identifiers for carbon projects, which enables further transparency to grow. Diversification, buyers are actually thinking, what type of project should I invest in? Should I have a portfolio approach? And lastly, we see Article 6 as being a huge accelerator in this market. As I've said before, we've seen Article 6.2 developing over the last year, and we're excited to see how this continues to develop over the next coming UN negotiations. These innovations will continue to build cred credibility and transparency. And I think it's important to say that the integration of voluntary and compliance markets will act to accelerate this market further. Lastly, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for inviting me to be here today. I really look forward to engaging with you all during the conference and exploring how we can collectively advance the integrity and impact of carbon markets. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give her a big round of applause. Lily Ginsburg Cake. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, on the stage is dedicated to combating climate change and her efforts have been far-reaching and wide. Her keen focus is on addressing factors contributing to climate change, effects like floods and landslides. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Commissioner for Climate Change at the Ministry of Water and Environment, Margaret Atieno Mwebesa. Big round of applause. I'm the Commissioner of Climate Change under the Ministry of Water and Environment and also the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change National Focal Point uh, for Uganda. My Honorable Minister of State for Environment, Honorable Beatrice Anua, uh, representative of the Minister for Energy and Mineral Development, uh, development partners here present. I don't know if we have members of Parliament of Uganda here present. The organizers of this very important forum, the East Africa Carbon Market Forum. Our main host, one MTN, uh, Madame Annette, and your team, Seagrass, Vera, and other partners who have supported her. The international and national private sector here present. A representative of Uganda Investment Authority. Representatives of ministries, departments and agencies. Representatives of the academia and research institutes. Representatives of the youth. The media, ladies and gentlemen. I will not say I bring you greetings from the Minister of Water and Environment because my Honorable Minister is here. She's here with us. 
I'm greatly honored to be part of this forum, which presents a crucial step, not only for Uganda, but the region as a whole, towards practical approaches to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also reaping the rich benefits of carbon markets for a future resilient society. Uh, once again, my appreciation to the organizers of this uh, uh, forum. I will not go into details. My minister has uh, emphasized her appreciation. Green Horizons, charting Uganda's journey towards climate resilience is my topic. The global nature of climate change necessitates widespread coordination, cooperation, and participation in an international response. With climate change, you can't do it alone. We need to do it, we need to cooperate, and it is all inclusive, leaving no one behind. So Uganda, by signing and ratifying both the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and its implementation frameworks, that is the Choto Protocol and the Pari Agreement, it means Uganda is committed to the adop adoption and implementation of policies and measures designed to mitigate climate change and adapt to its effects. The Pari Agreement further stipulates that at least $100 billion from public and private sources must be mobilized each year since 2020 to 2025 to fund projects and help developing countries implement their greenhouse gas emission reductions and adapt to the impa impacts of climate change. However, this hasn't been realized in any year since. So we really need to look outside the box. We really need to be very innovative. Uh, during COP28, we had a very weak outcome under the new collective quantified goal on climate finance. So what does that mean? We really need to be very innovative. This was deferred uh, to be decided at COP29 this year, and we hope that we shall have something positive out of this. We also have a report that was released by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development at COP28. It calculated that we need 500, that $500 billion should be channeled to developing countries by 2025 under the new finance goal to support climate action. And this should be scaled up to 1.55 trillion by 2030. However, this is not forthcoming, and yet communities, economies, the environment continue to suffer as a result of climate change impacts. So nations have to chart ways out of addressing and financing climate change response measures and actions, and that is what Uganda is really doing. As you may all be aware, Uganda also communicated her National Climate Change Action Plan, or what is referred to the, as the Nationally Determined Contribution to the, United, to the UNFCCC in 2022. And for us as Uganda, we are committed further to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 24.7%, which is equivalent to 36.7% million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent below business as usual by 2030. But how are we going to do it? As I said, the money is not forthcoming, but we have committed ourselves that we have to do something. In terms of the policy, legal, and institutional framework to deal with climate change, the government has enacted the National Climate Change Act 2021, which also provides for an institutional framework for coordination and implementation of climate change uh, measures. The Climate Change Act further amended the Public Finance Act to provide for, to ensure that there is funding once the national budget framework paper is uh, prepared. So the Minister of Water and Environment, uh, with the support of the technical support of Climate Change Department, each year 
certifies the national budget framework paper. But I can assure you it is not very good, but we have been doing it. We have to ensure that the budget is responsive and contains adequate allocation for funding climate change measures and actions. But where is all this resource coming from? Um, under Section 9 of the Act, the Minister of Water and Environment is in the final stages of developing the national climate change mechanism regulations and guidelines, commonly known as ca carbon regulations, to help in guiding the country and carbon developers in the participation of, of carbon trade. My minister has emphasized this and given us very clearly where we are and what is expected of us. However, these regulations will provide an enabling and fair environment for carbon trade in the country. We did it in a very consultative manner. We've had a number of consultations. We are now at the tail end of developing, uh, completing uh, drafting of the carbon regulations. And we really hope it is going to attract uh, trade and it is also going to be very um, a fair play ground for all of us. Uh, the Paris Agreement also sets out uh, how countries can pursue voluntary cooperation to reach their climate targets in the implementation of their NDC to allow for mitigation ambition and to provide for uh, adaptation mitigation measures. So Uganda is looking at carbon trade as one of the means for us to really go into implementing our climate Cl uh, National Climate Action Plan, or the NDC. So in Uganda, we believe, uh, we, uh, as Uganda, we believe a more coordinated uh, effort across the region and continent is required to reap the rich benefits of the carb of carbon trade, uh, is this, uh, to reap the benefits of uh, carbon trade and I send my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this uh, forum because it is bringing us all together to bring in our views, to learn from each other, to hear how others are doing it and see how we can also do it in our own countries. Uh, dear participants, carbon trading has serious economic benefits to countries and for us as Uganda, we are naturally wealthy. We have a very rich carbon I mean natural wealth in terms of forests, biodiversity, wetlands, peatlands, water bodies, soils, ecosystems. Those are all very good potential areas for carbon trade. So for us as a country, we know we have a very big potential to go into carbon trade. Uganda's uh, uh, NDC requires $28.1 billion until 2030, which means annually we need about US dollars 4.1 billion, which translates into about 16.4 trillion, trillion Uganda shillings. This is much more than what government, the whole of government puts in in a year. But just for climate change, that's what we need. And also in addition, Uganda's green growth strategy 2017 up to 2030 summarizes Uganda's climate action commitment. In the first half of 2023-2024, according to our Minister of Finance, the Climate Finance Unit, Uganda was able to mobilize US dollars 272.6 million to support adaptation and mitigation initiatives across various uh, um, uh, sectors. But however, this still falls below the required national climate finance that the country requires. Therefore, other innovative financing mechanisms are being explored, as I have mentioned, including carbon trade. That's why we are trying to do it very well, so that we really benefit from our carbon trade. We have very wealthy um, uh, natural resource, peatlands, wetlands, forests, waters, the entire ecosystem. We are very wealthy when it comes to natural resources. However, there are other efforts being undertaken to bridge the finance gap as Uganda. 
we are, de we've, uh, we, are uh, de we are developing the national climate finance strategy. We're running from, we have developed the national climate change strategy, which will run from 2023 to 2030. And we expect to mobilize resources. And this will help us also utilize and track climate financing. Because currently, we are not really able to, um, to properly track climate financing as a country. Uh, the development of our state of national climate finance report to track progress and deficit is also underway. We are also uh, developing a national green tax taxonomy, a system or classification framework used to categorize economic activities and investments that are considered environmentally sustainable or not. Uh, we have also, we also, with support from the World Bank, we came up with a uh, climate change budget, budget tagging tool, and I think this was a very big step for us. And we have a special ta uh, um, vote uh, when it comes to uh, the national budgeting framework, a special vote for, vote for mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, budgeting for climate change activities and uh, measures. Also, as a country, working with the World Bank, uh, we have developed a country climate change development report and the key requirements for accessing uh, funding. We are also deploying innovative climate finance mechanisms. As I said, we have to move, look outside the box. So we are employing innovative climate funding, uh, finance mechanisms. Uh, we are looking at green bond issuance, carbon markets trade, restructuring debt uh, for nature swaps, uh, and blended finance tools. Uh, we are also uh, striving to ensure we have bankable projects. We have a number of bankable pi pipeline projects targeting both bilateral uh, funding, but also funding from the UNFCCC mechanisms. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Water and Environment is continuing to build the capacity of the central and local governments. The Climate Change Act provides that de uh, every ministry, department, agency, lead agency should come up with climate change action plans. And the minister responsible for finance should provide resources to, to implement those uh, action plans. So the ministry is really working towards that to ensure that at least the districts have district climate change action plans. Uh, in, 20, in June 2023, Uganda embarked on the development of a national climate change ad adaptation plan, and this process aims to strengthen the resilience to climate change impacts by mainstreaming adaptation into policies and programs at all levels. Uh, we also have the Uganda, gr Uganda's Green Eco Economy Recovery Action Plan, which was launched in 2022, which provides solutions to the combined challenges of the country's COVID-19 recovery and climate change. And it focuses on critical areas such as renewable energy, resilient agriculture, resilient cities, land use, and biodiversity. Government of Uganda is also encouraging a low carbon development uh, path. And government is encouraging some uh, companies such as Uganda Breweries Limited, Kakira Sugar Works Limited, Umeme, among others, to implement initiatives to offset their scopes. That is scopes one and two emissions, such as promotion of fuel mix during production and investing in sustainable workplaces and offices. For example, with lead lighting, efficient heating and cooling systems, and also training workers on energy and water savings tips. Participants, Government of Uganda, and in particular, Minister of Water and Environment, is committed to support individuals, corporate, in, corporate institutions or entities, and the community to address climate change actions that reduce emissions and promote low development pathway and resilient communities 
to the impacts of climate change. As a representative of uh, the Minister of Water and Environment responsible for climate change department, and also the UNFCCC national focal point, I urge us all to take caution in our actions and choices to align with the low emission development pathways as a way to, limi to limit our climate crisis. I thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner for Climate Change at the Ministry of Water and Environment Uganda, Margaret Atieno Mebesa. All right, so in other news, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to let you know that we have an ongoing workshop upstairs on the first floor, and at exactly 12.30, we're going to have a presentation by Patrick Ayota from the NSSF. He's going to be talking about future-proofing East Africa, the role of ESG in sustainable development. So if you're interested in that, kindly make time from 12.30 upstairs on the first floor. We'd also like to let you know that lunch is going to be served from 1 o'clock until 3 o'clock. So please feel free to get yourself a coupon at the registration desk. Lunch will be served between 1 and 3 p.m. And it will be available to you free of charge, but please get a coupon before you go and have your lunch. So our next presenter has a lot of experience across West and Southern Africa when it comes to energy exploration. She's worked with big brands like Unilever and served as an engineering manager. Her, well, her big forte right now is combating climate change and poverty while protecting local environments, leveraging carbon finance to make cleaner technologies accessible to low-income communities. Speaking about the practical implementation of Article 6 framework in Tanzania, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from Up Energy, Rehema Mbalamwezi. Round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rehema Mbalamwezi, and I represent Up Energy. Up Energy is a social enterprise that um, develops cleaner technology for, for low income households um, who are most vulnerable to climate change. And we are excited to be here in Kampala. We were founded here 11 years ago and we've been deploying cleaner technology um, in Uganda for the last decade. Um, currently, we operate in eight African markets. And um, my role is uh, to lead the implementation of the projects in these different countries. Our projects currently include life-changing technologies such as electric cooking, safe water systems, and fuel efficient stoves designed to support um, local communities and households. Um, we also work on carbon removal projects that support those most vulnerable within the agricultural supply chains, such as biochar projects. Um, our projects not only reduce emission, but also offer tangible co-benefits such as improved gender equality, improved health, and um, we typically utilize carbon finance to, um, to address affordability and accessibility of cleaner technologies for low-income households, which are also typically most vulnerable to climate change impacts. And our approach is an end-to-end -end approach. We've developed over 100 projects to date, benefited over 7 million um, beneficiaries by creating really localized projects that have local teams who are um, specialists in deploying um, these technologies. We build local manufacturing supply chains. We build um, capacity for rigorous monitoring and um, and, uh, and, ad and, and advanced monitoring in our operations. 
we also have in-house product development teams that are continuously improving our technology. We also have specialized carbon technical expertise um, that enables us really to develop high quality projects um, with um, basically an internal knowledge bank. Um, we also have specialist teams that are um, day to day work to deploy climate finance into these projects. So we've been able to deliver high integrity, measurable impacts, and significant social benefits in our projects. And um, I'd like to talk about our work on Article 6. Um, currently, we are working on developing projects under both Article 6.2 and 6.4 of the Paris Agreement. Um, we work to seek authorizations from ICAO-approved voluntary standards to supply registries such as Corsia um, that require unilateral offset claims um, one such example of the work that we do in this area is um, recently in April in Tanzania, we were able to secure the first authorization of, um, of credits uh, from our cleaner cookstove project there. And maybe just to also um, just explain briefly what Article 6 is, it's simply the cooperative mechanism of the Paris Agreement. It enables countries to meet their climate ambitions collaboratively by establishing framework for international cooperation. Um, countries are able to finance, develop, and ultimately transfer um, carbon reduction efforts or ITMOS across borders. And at its core, Article 6 bilateral agreements facilitate implementation, implementation of internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. So basically allowing sovereign countries to um, invest in significant climate um, action in countries such as Tanzania or Ghana, where we are also currently implementing an Article 6 project, um, to decarbonize key sectors, uh, for example, and in return to support the climate ambition of um, essentially the buyer country's um, ambition. So through this mechanism, countries not just meet their own commitments, their NDCs, but are also able to receive you know, critical funding to implement key strategic energy or any other um, environment projects, but all the while supporting um, climate, uh, global climate ambition through the transfer of ITMOS. Um, and a key component of Article 6 is corresponding adjustments, which are basically just an accounting on how um, carbon credits are, are retired and traded. So this ensures that when a, a carbon credit is traded, that it is only accounted once and the local registries adjust for, for this uh, transfer of credits. So this addresses key transparency and um, credibility issues. And um, there are also tangible um, benefits to Article 6 um, engagements. Um, so for example, in Tanzania, uh, where we secured the recent Article 6 um, authorization for corresponding adjustment, uh, the government of Tanzania basically included the optionality of um, corresponding adjustments in their carbon trading regulations that um, they improved in 2023. So this provided a key optional mechanism for, for developers to, to utilize um, cooperative approaches in, um, in financing um, key projects in the country. Um, and uh, speaking of Tanzania, for example, they have a very ambitious goal of uh, transitioning 80% of their population from, or our population, I'm Tanzanian, uh, from, uh, to cleaner cooking by 2034. So in 10 years, they have an ambition of transitioning the country, which currently sits at just 9% clean cooking access, to 80%. And to achieve this, they need to unlock all um, optionalities in terms of um, 
climate financing and uh, mobilizing um, significant investment in, in this sector and others. Um, they've estimated that they will require $2 billion to achieve this by 2034. And so it becomes clear that adding that optionality to their regulations for Article 6 um, projects you know, goes towards um, supporting and facilitating ambitious investment into these sectors. Um, and these approaches will not just benefit clean cooking, um, that's just one such example, but typically many projects under Article 6 involve development of renewable energy resources, um, afforestation projects, energy efficiency initiatives, which can help countries reduce their dependency on imported fuels, enhance their energy security, and lower energy costs in the long term. Um, specifically for our case, we also have um, an electric cooking project that enables um, you know, communities in, 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 in Tanzania to basically leapfrog from um, biomass cooking to electric cooking, um, you know, utilizing the huge investment that the government has made in electricity access, which is currently sitting at 93% for Tanzania. Um, additionally, current practices in the region for countries that are implementing Article 6 mechanism is to charge a percentage fee um, of revenues um, to also support um, redeployment of finance to adaptation projects and other key identified initiatives. So Tanzania specifically is charging 9% of carbon revenues and these will be redeployed to key strategic adaptation and environmental initiatives including cl clean cooking um, as, as, as one specific one. Um, Another benefit of Article 6 mechanism is the increased integrity. Um, countries are really brought to the forefront in the involvement of the implementation of these projects. In our experience, both in Ghana and Tanzania now, a full transparency is required with all stakeholders. Government are involved from the beginning to, to the end. Um, and this facilitates cooperation, transparency, and, and at the end really improves integrity of the whole um, marketplace. Uh, for Up Energy in particular, Article 6 enables us to bring financing to broaden our impact, expanding the scale of our impact, um, not just in our decarbonization efforts, but impacts such as increased employment, increased um, health benefits, you know, gender, uh, gender benefits, while at the same time benefiting local communities. And it's important to note that there is a demand um, from corporate buyers for um, authorized credits under Article 6, and mostly due to the greater transparency and integrity that I, I have already mentioned previously. Uh, and, and this, at the end, benefits um, host countries and, uh, and, and local communities. So um, in conclusion, um, Article 6 presents a unique opportunity to combine uh, financial power of global climate markets with projects that benefit local adaptation and uh, mitigation ambition. It offers really an avenue for driving further financial, really much needed capital into, um, and resources into African countries. And at Up Energy, we are focused in building projects that channel the value of these markets and, and, and such financing into tangible um, benefits uh, to the communities. Uh, but we need um, more action on, on, on Article 6. We need a collaborative approach um, governments uh, need to identify focus area for international climate co collaboration, need to prepare uh, transparent frameworks and guidelines that outline how developers can engage in um, bilateral uh, corporations, for example, and how carbon accounting will be performed. And developers, in turn, need to constantly build um, and innovate greater projects with better quality, 
diligent monitoring and sustained and continuous and sustained involvement and, and benefit um, that is visible to the local communities that they are working in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rema. All right. So, la ladies and gentlemen, I know we've had a barrage of presentations, and one of the things that happens is that once there's an information overload, sometimes people will slow down a bit. So I'd like to just ask everybody to stand up a bit. Everybody stand up. This is just a physical fitness break. All right. Everybody just, just twist the waist a bit, get the blood flowing again. Lift up one foot, lift up another foot. All right. Uh, twist to the right and to the left, turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, wake up. <laughs> tell your neighbor to wake up, it's not time to be sleeping. <laughs> Serious information is going to be shared right now. All right, please take your seats, please take your seats. So our next presentation is an interesting one. It's exploring Article 6 and its implications for East African nations. But the panel could not have been more interesting. The first panelist I'm going to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, is somebody who has an extremely interesting CV. He's a National Geographic award-winning photographer, and he completed the Antler VC Accelerator in Nairobi last year. Prior to joining the company, he served in the British Army, where he commanded soldiers on operations in reconnaissance. Right now, he works with farmers to come up with solutions to restore degraded soils. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO and co-founder of Flux, Sam Davies. Big round of applause. Next on stage, ladies and gentlemen, comes a gentleman who has a pedigree which I can say I also, well, I, I think uh, I also subscribe to. He comes from one of the oldest secondary schools in Uganda, set up in 1902. He's a man who is specialized in intellectual property law, technology law, with a bias towards digital trade, fintech, data protection, and privacy law. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kenneth Muhanji from KTA Advocates. Ladies and gentlemen, our next individual is currently a fellow at Harvard University where his research and te teaching is focusing on financing the energy transition. His background is economics and finance and he has served as a senior consultant to the World Bank, previously working at Morgan Stanley for over a decade. Please welcome Ellie Sandler. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome the individual who is going to be managing this entire panel. They work in carbon policy and project integrity. Her role involves working with governments, tracking Article 6 policy developments, carbon market regulation across Africa, but her background is in social business, monitoring, evaluation, gender, and development. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the head of carbon strategy at Bern, Molly Brown. If we can have Molly's microphone on, please. Hello. Okay, hi. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think we're the final panel session before lunch, so we will try and keep it uh, energetic, brief, um, and to the point. Um, we actually wanted to start by... Um, Molly, I, I think this microphone sounds a lot better than that one. I'm going to hand this over to you. Thanks very much. 
Um, we actually wanted to start by asking you, the audience, some questions. So brace yourselves. I wondered um, whether people could maybe indicate by show of hands what part of the market you are from. So if you're a project developer, will you raise your hand? Okay, mostly project developers. Anyone here from government? Okay. Uh, anyone here an investor? Okay, two guys at the back, all you project developers. Go and find him at lunch. Anyone a buyer? No. Oh, same guy. Um, and anyone here from kind of tech, digital innovation? Those kind of guys? Okay, wonderful. So we've got a bit of a mix in the room. Um, and we've got a bit of a mix on this panel, which is very exciting. Um, my next question for you is, how much do you think you know about Article 6? So can we have a hand up for the total experts in Article 6? Hopefully this panel as well. <laughs> Any experts in the room? Okay, we've got one. People who know a bit, but they're actually here to learn more. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, total newbies. Okay, total newbies, welcome. Everybody's welcome. Um, I'm actually going to invite you now to take one minute. Please turn to the person sitting next to you, and I want you to try and explain Article 6 to them. You have one minute. The best answer wins. Very good. Okay, does anyone want to volunteer? Do we have a roving mic? Does anyone want to volunteer to explain to the room what Article 6 is? Hands up, there's a lady at the back. Are you volunteering to explain Article 6 to the room? There's a hand over there. Who, who's got the mic? Yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, simple terms, Article 6 is a collaborative arrangement in which countries can meet their Paris Agreement commitments. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, we can all go home. Um, okay, we wanted to start, um, we've got a plan of what we think you might want to know about Article 6, but instead of us talking at you and then you asking questions at the end, we wanted you to have an opportunity to ask questions now and we can integrate answers to those questions as we go along. So if anyone has any questions they would like us to address on Article 6, do you want to raise your hands now? Okay, gentleman at the front. Thank you very much, Peter Nyakum and Ulysses Energy. Uh, I'd like to learn a bit more about how Article 6 um, caters to the carbon removals ecosystem. Great, we were just discussing that over coffee. Anyone else got any questions they'd like us to answer during the next half an hour or so? One at the back. Uh, <clears throat> as a developer who has access to corresponding adjusted carbon credits, I'm curious to understand how we move the discussion away from risk around revocation, particularly for governments in East Africa who are ahead of the curve in understanding the Article 6 environment and start putting more pressure instead on the, what I believe should be the people to regulate the market, such as the UN, um, who are in charge of UNFCCC and as well as ICAO. Yeah, good question. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Okay. I'll start with you and then come back to you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm one of the newbies about Article 6, but uh, from one of the previous speakers, the uh, Commissioner for Climate Change, there has been a, uh, a frustration in terms of funding uh, for so many years, and even the 2020 up to 2030 seems like 
there would not be money elsewhere unless we have some ways of developing it ourselves. I want to know what Article uh, 6 has to do about that money gap in our system. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Uh, my question is related to what he has asked. I'm also new about Article 6. Uh, the $100 billion uh, promised by adaptation has been a tall order, as well as uh, the loss and damage fund. Uh, people say it's unlikely to be successful. So uh, how can countries working under Article 6 work together to get money for climate change adaptation and mitigation? Okay, amazing. That's four great questions. Any final ones or should we, okay, one final one and then we'll get cracking. Um, <clears throat> I guess mine is more of, given all the facts that there is about Article 6, what are the risks that it will, it might face the same fate as Kyoto Protocol? Specifically, <laughs> the same fate as the, as the Kyoto Protocol. So Specifically, basically, which fate? What, what is the risk that it, it will not succeed? And then okay. what, what happens when beyond 2030? Okay, perfect. That's, I think, a really good set of questions to start with. Thank you all so much. Um, by way of introduction, um, we've got a lot of exciting developments happening here in East Africa around Article 6. Um, we have Rwanda who issued some of the very first correspondingly adjusted uh, cook stove carbon credits back in November, December. Um, we had Tanzania recently issuing their first LOA, again, to a cook stove um, carbon project developer. Um, Kenya, as you may know, made an amendment to the Climate Change Act back in September and has made great progress on her carbon market regulations, which are almost ready. Um, Uganda, as we know, um, is almost ready as well. We heard from the minister this morning that um, that's soon to be gazetted, which is very exciting. So there's, there's a lot going on in East Africa. It's not quite ready yet at scale, but we're getting there. Um, so in this context, we wanted to explore opportunities for uh, financing, opportunities for project developers, and what kind of institutional frameworks we need to have in place to make sure that East Africa can make the most of this opportunity. On that note, Eli, do you want to start? Um, we're interested in doing a kind of zoom out first on like what's happening globally, and then we'll zoom back in again to East Africa. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think Kenneth is going to talk a lot about what's happening in East Africa in terms of the plumbing of Article 6, what you need to do to get your credits registered. So maybe I'll take a couple of minutes to step back and say, what is the point of this thing that we designed in 2015, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, and what does it mean to each participant in the market? So um, as mentioned, I kind of have two jobs. One is that I teach climate finance at Harvard, and I'm also an advisor to a bunch of companies. Um, here I'm working with Seagrass, which is a, a climate finance exchange and, and company. Um, so when Article 6 was designed under the Paris Agreement, and I'm going to try and answer a couple of the questions, the point was to say that carbon emissions in developing countries often cost less than carbon emissions reductions in developed countries. But we have a problem of upfront financing. So if we want to build renewable energy in Uganda, or we want to build uh, electrification infrastructure in Burundi, two projects that we're working on at the moment through Seagrass, um, the problem is we don't have the upfront financing. And actually, if we had the upfront financing, we might be able to reduce emissions on um, development. So we might be able to develop in a, a way that doesn't increase emissions but does increase energy use. And so Article 6 was meant to say there's a whole bunch of reasons that developed countries want to reduce emissions. Part of it is uh, NDCs under the Paris Agreement. So part of it is these international climate targets. Um, but another part of it is that a lot of individual companies have made uh, pledges that might be voluntary or they're subject to carbon taxes. So uh, in the UK, for example, in the EU, in a lot of American states, companies have to pay a price on carbon. And the Commissioner for Energy in Rwanda spoke about the fact that this is one of the key ways we're going to fight climate change. We're going to price carbon. And Article 6 was meant to create a single fungible credit that could be used for America's NDC, Europe's NDC, a British company's carbon taxes, the CBAM, everything. And this means that there's a huge amount of fundamental economic value to this credit. 
why do companies buy voluntary credits at the moment? They have a voluntary pledge. They've said they will, kind of out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and in my mind, that's actually the reason markets are limited. There's a lot of problems with integrity, there's a lot of problems with monitoring, there's a lot of problems with digitalization, but fundamentally the reason that carbon markets are small at the moment is because they're voluntary. And companies don't voluntary, voluntarily give up billions of dollars. Article 6, on the other hand, means that if you have a carbon tax you have to pay, legally have to pay it, potentially you can get a credit that will be cheaper than paying the tax. Or if you're a country that has committed to reduce your emissions, it might be more effective to reduce it by Article 6. And so this is kind of the policy half of what I do, which is at Harvard. That's why we designed Article 6, and it goes to several of the questions about, like, what do we need to do next? We need to find buyers that can use these things to pay their taxes. This is why everyone is focused on Coursera at the moment. It's the first instance of Article 6 credits, correspondingly adjusted credits, being used to pay a tax. The other half of what I do is working with Seagrass. So we're developing a few projects. Um, I'm going to talk about them later in a session, like, literally right after this, so I'll go into the mechanics. But basically, we're, we're building a, like a transmission line in Rwanda, and we're electrifying households in Burundi. And I think the reason we should care about this at a global level is that until now, carbon has been used to do really, really great things, like pay for those cook stoves on the, on the stage, which Molly's leading at Bern. And like, that is really impactful. It reduces carbon emissions, it helps with development, but fundamentally, you can't transform an economy with cook stoves. You need to rebuild the energy system. You need to build transmission, you need to build renewable energy. Um, and so what we're working on, and I'm happy to talk about it and, and talk about the global direction of travel, is saying, can Article 6 financing be a type of climate finance that governments access? In the same way as they access World Bank loans, in the same way as they might access bilateral lending from another country, can Article 6 be a way that a, a government funds its national infrastructure and then gives it out to developers like we have in the room and on, on stage? Um, so what's happening at the moment is things around CBAM, things around companies that I can talk about with Seagrass, but that, I hope, kind of frames the, the global question in a way that maybe you can ask specifics about East Africa afterwards. And on that note, Kenneth, do you want to go next on what's happening in Uganda? What's the process? What's the progress? Um, and what do we think the kind of next steps are in terms of operationalizing Article 6 here? Thank you. So, what's happening in Uganda at the moment? I think for, well, not I think, I know that uh, one of the things that we love as Ugandans is how forward thinking we are and usually how we also lead the charge. In the region, Tanzania, Kenya have uh, already developed draft regulations. Uganda is in the process of also finalizing our regulations and we've actually had a lot of stakeholder engagement and I'm glad that the commissioner was here in the morning and gave you an update on that. So what we're waiting now is really just uh, putting the final touches, so to speak, to see exactly how is this entire industry going to be regulated, how are you as a player going to be able to get authorization from the Ministry of Water. So maybe if I can just be able to uh, go back a little bit. The ministry that's in charge of regulating carbon credits or the entire industry in Uganda is the Ministry of Water and Environment. And we have a carbon credits directorate which is headed by the commissioner, who, Margaret, who spoke here in the morning. And so if you're going to invest in any project in Uganda, you need a letter of authorization, or in the past we call this a letter of no objection. And so these regulations basically spell out or will dictate exactly what you need before you're able to get that letter of authorization. And then of course maybe what I'll also highlight is in Uganda we have what we call an evidence-based approach to regulation. In the sense that when we have emerging areas, uh, for those of us that know, for example, about payments, payments was a new, uh, was a, a new, actually, mobile payments was a new uh, innovation, every, you know, anyway, in the world. And in, East, in uh, East Africa, mobile money was something that I can say was started in East Africa. And perhaps that's why it has also failed to take off uh, in many other places. But in terms of regulations as well, we waited as a country before we passed the National Payment Systems Act. And so that act was passed in 2021 and uh, the regulations uh, shortly thereafter. But also, really, the regulators wanted to see how the market was going to react, how the market perhaps would also be able to drive in uh, terms of coming up with uh, uh, proper clauses or policies that would work for industries rather than stifle them. 
And so that approach, I feel, is also the one that the government of Uganda is also taking as we come up with these regulations. Although the regulations are out and we've, we've, we have had this, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, consulted a number of uh, players to be able to come up with the draft that we have. But even as that particular piece of legislation comes out, it will also be possible to keep interacting with government to try and refine it and also make sure that as we keep learning, we have a law or we have uh, rules that will uh, enable all of us or the players that are in this room to be able to trade in credits in a manner that will benefit communities but will also be able to benefit government. And then, of course, also speak to the wider, uh, the wider issue, which is climate change. And so that's really where we are at the moment in Uganda. And uh, maybe what I'll also add as well is borrowing from other countries like Ghana that have put, you know, that Ghana has a white list of projects that the government can easily support and that also for those of you that are in the room that are interested. And so we are also hoping that Uganda will also be able to, you know, follow that same approach. One of the things that we're doing at this particular forum as well, which I'll talk about this later, is to associate all of you that are in this particular industry. So we hope that with a wider voice, it will be easier for us to be able to speak with uh, government, but also share with them what should be the best practice when it comes to an industry like this one that is uh, nascent. So that's really where we are uh, at the moment, and I'm glad that we have a number of players that are really thriving and will continue to thrive in our ecosystem. Great, thanks, Kenneth. That's a really helpful summary of what's happening in Uganda. Um, Sam, I was hoping to turn to you, last but not least. Um, as a newish project developer um, in the CDR space, how are you thinking about Article 6? Do you see there being more or less opportunity than the VCM? And can you answer specifically this gentleman at the front's question around how CDR is being treated, sorry, that's carbon dioxide removals, are being treated uh, in Article 6? Does your thing work? Do you want to have a go? Hello. Oh, okay. Ah, yeah, great. <coughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, maybe first it's useful to clarify a bit about CDR and then enhance rock weathering and, and how that fits into the whole ecosystem because when we have a carbon conference, I'm sure everyone here in this room has their own sort of definition and priority for what carbon means. Does it mean uh, reductions? Does it mean removals? Does it mean avoidance? Does it mean renewable energy? There's so many different concepts out there. And I think maybe something we can touch on later, this is one of the challenges that Article 6 has, is that trying to wrap up all these different definitions into one framework is by its definition really tricky and will therefore take a lot of time. Time is something that we don't really have a huge amount of. We want to get going as quickly as possible. We want to be able to drive climate finance as fast as possible to developing nations and we want to be able to reduce emissions and remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So. That's kind of a, a bit of an aside, I guess. Carbon dioxide removal, or CDRs, as Molly's referring to, generally refers to more engineered ways of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. A lot of people are quite familiar with direct air capture, or DAC, um, which uses machines to essentially suck and absorb carbon straight from the atmosphere. Um, and then there's a, a variety of different technologies along the scale, of which enhanced rock weathering is kind of a combination. Basically, we combine a natural process of uh, rock weathering, which happens around the world, and we try and speed it up. We do that by crushing rocks and spreading them onto farmland, where they dissolve with, rock, uh, with rainwater, capture carbon, and improve soil health. So in that sense, it's a very different methodology from um, other traditional nature-based solutions. And in terms of Article 6 and how it fits into the voluntary carbon market, at the moment, the VCM has been catalytic for carbon dioxide removal suppliers because it allows voluntary purchasers, as Eli said, to basically fund innovation and explore this new section of the market. It hasn't been going for as long, the methodologies aren't as developed, and so the science is evolving and the verification process is evolving. CDR, I think it's fair to say, has learned from previous iterations of the voluntary carbon market, and the standard that is now being set voluntarily by these companies is really, really high. And I think how that plays into Article 6 is that for CDR and enhanced rock weathering to be accepted by Article 6.4, the supervisory board, 
they will demand a very high level of integrity and a very high level of quality. So I think for the CDR community, Article 6.4 should be seen as a goal in terms of integrity and authenticity that potentially we're already at that mark, but to, for that to be approved is going to take a little bit of time. And the potential, the voluntary carbon market is quite small at the moment, as Eli referred to, but it can be catalytic in terms of the development of the projects and then allow us to access the much bigger uh, 6.4 market in the future. So thinking about funding for CDR and also more widely um, to the gentleman's question at the back, funding for other projects, infrastructure, um, on a project level, but also on a government level. Eli, I wondered if you wanted to. I just wanted to pick up on something that Sam said and then maybe take another way of answering the question about if Article 6 can be used for carbon dioxide removal. Um, so like, just thinking back to why we wrote Article 6, we keep referring to it, it's meant to be a way for developing countries to reach their indices. And so when the Paris Agreement was negotiated, we said, look, we're going to have this voluntary system where every country picks their own target. This goes to the other question about why the CDM failed. The CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, kind of like Article 6 with the Kyoto Protocol, the predecessor to the Paris Agreement. It failed because the Kyoto Protocols failed. Under the Kyoto Protocols, the original version of the UNFCCC, the UN told every country, this is the emissions reductions you're going to reach, and then no one wanted to do it. And so we came together and we said, actually, every country is going to set a voluntary target. They're going to voluntarily commit to reduce emissions. Um, and that's how we're going to build consensus about emissions reductions. And the way we got developing countries like Uganda, like Rwanda, the way the UN incentivized them to set ambitious targets was to say, we'll help pay for it. So that's why so many developing countries have these conditional NDCs. It means we will uh, reduce our carbon emissions. We will install renewable energy if the international community helps finance it. And one of those financing mechanisms is Article 6. Now, why this matters for CDR is that most CDR is not really part of a country's development. It does really good things. So Sam's company, Flux, it helps farmers grow more crops. It helps increase yield. But it's not fundamentally a core part of a country's infrastructure development. Um, we have a different article of the Paris Agreement to deal with carbon dioxide removal. Article 4, carbon sinks. And there's supposed to be a lot of international funding, both for things like CDR or things like nature-based solutions, it wasn't originally an Article 6 question. Article 6 was about funding infrastructure. And so then the question of whether CDR is going to be included in Article 6 and whether um, the minister, for example, here that was before the Ugandan Minister of Environment, um, the question is whether countries view this as a way to reach their NDCs. So can they crowd in additional capital because they'll get co-financing because of the agricultural yields increasing or something like this. Um, when Sam and I were talking earlier, we compared the potential size of a, a carbon market for CDR, best case, $1 billion, $2 billion, $3 billion. Let's compare that to what the United States government has said it's going to pay for carbon dioxide removal just in the United States. Two, $3 billion global market, $100 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act, $200 billion, we don't really know. To me, CDR is a question for governments, and they should be funding it because there's a national good. And I think Sam is completely right that the voluntary market has been really useful because it's let us have the architecture for monitoring. It's let us have the architecture for how a government might actually go about funding these projects. But m my own view, and maybe it's not popular with CDR developers, is that actually Article 6 is unlikely to be a huge source of revenue. Um, probably that's more of an infrastructure play, my view. Great, thanks. Um, so going to how governments can get capacity, can get ready for this, um, Kenneth, do you have a take on kind of where East Africa's at, where Uganda's at at the moment, what support they need to access Article 6 and decide, you know, is it for infrastructure, is it for cooking, setting the whitelist, and who should be providing that support? Whenever I tr oh, okay, it's on. Hallelujah. All right. So I feel that one, one of the things that Article 6 really emphasizes is the need for governments to speak to each other. So I was also having a discussion with a, a colleague earlier on. I don't think, and really this is only my view, uh, that Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, if we're looking at it from East Africa, should be able to create these frameworks on their own. I feel this is the perfect time to be able to do this as an East African federation. Why? 
Because one, when it comes down to uh, the entire world is still grappling with one, how are we going to price these credits? How are we going to tax these credits? Uh, for those of us that uh, uh, are interested in, in, those, uh, in those areas, the issue of whether you can have a carbon tax or a tax on carbon. If you have a carbon tax, the challenge is that that may uh, prohibit development in the sense that as Uganda, for example, we've only just discovered oil. And so the question is, should you limit the exploration of that oil merely because you know, you're trying to move with the rest of the world? And I think that's also where the disparity is when you speak to many Ugandans, they're saying, look, we don't have the same problems as the developed world. Well, I would think that that is still a little bit short-sighted because we will get there. And at the same point, we all share the same planet. That's why we're here. So I feel when it comes to discussions around... NBS happening now. Join over 1 million people in person, 14 million on TV, and 21 million people online commemorating the Uganda Matters Day at the Namugongo Shrine. Let your brand connect with a devout audience. On June 3rd, witness a tribute to the brave souls who stood firm in their faith even in the face of persecution. Be part of this unforgettable event filled with inspiring speeches, uplifting music, and moments of reflection. Tune in to NBS and join the commemoration live from Namgongo Shrine as we honor the legacy of the Uganda Matters. Don't miss out on this profound moment 